Welcome in, Hokies fans, to this edition of the Tech Sideline Podcast. We record on Wednesday, April 20th, and on episode 235, we're going to look back at a busy spring game weekend in Blacksburg. On episode 235, we'll look back at Brent Pry's first exhibition as head football coach. We'll look at busy weekends on the diamond with softball and baseball getting huge series wins and much more. All of that coming up on episode 235 of the Tech Sideline Podcast, which starts right now. We welcome you in to episode 235 of the Tech Sideline Podcast. However you are listening, whether that's archived on Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, SoundCloud, or Stitcher, or if you're watching on YouTube, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and turn notifications on so you know when the Tech Sideline Podcast goes live every single week. And if you are in our live stream, be sure to leave a comment or question for Will, David, and Chris. We'll get to those at the end of the show. As always, the Tech Sideline Podcast is brought to you by the Southeast Regional Training Center. You can help bring Olympic hopeful athletes to one of the best and fastest growing wrestling programs in the country. Visit southeastrtc.com to learn more and donate today. After a couple of special editions last week, we finally have the usual crew back on set. Uh, David Cunningham is across the way, our managing editor. He will be on set today. Chris Coleman to my right, lead analyst and columnist for Tech Sideline. Once again, our founder and general manager, Will Stewart, in the fourth chair with his VIP pass (laughs) on. (laughs) Our our VIP in the fourth chair today, Malcolm Stewart, best podcast producer in the land behind the scenes, and I'm your host, Jake Lyman. Before we get into everything, guys, it it was a fun, busy Easter spring game weekend. What were you guys up to this weekend? Uh, well, yeah. first the weather was great. Weather was fantastic. Yeah, and then it was not so great. <laughs> not yesterday. A couple days after that. Oh my um, gosh! Yeah, yeah, it snowed two days in a row in Blacksburg. It was insane. In mid-April. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, fun weekend. Uh, went to the the jam on Friday night. Spring jam. Yeah. Yep. Sons of Saturday hosted it. I think great event. I know Will Will was going to ask us to talk about it, but I, I know we had a lot of fun. Guys, could go catch some baseball and softball too over the weekend. Mm-hmm. They both had. We'll talk about it in a second, but they both played really well over the weekend. Spring football. Yeah. I don't know how much we we learned, but yeah, I had a um, lot of friends in town that I hadn't seen in a while. Yeah. Uh, all day tailgate on Saturday. Did absolutely nothing on Sunday. <laughs> yeah, as a result of Friday and Saturday. So, hey, yeah, so it was a fun weekend. It was a so good weekend. Chris's cooler Saturday was a was a tote. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I looked around and realized I didn't have a cooler because, like, I have I don't have my own like personal tailgating spot. I always tailgate hop, so I always get like sometimes I get one of the rolling coolers so that I can roll from lot to lot. Um, but last year for the Notre Dame game that my rolling cooler broke and I haven't replaced it. So I, I realized Saturday morning that I didn't have a cooler, so I had to improvise and it worked. <laughs> so you had my, you had my, uh, the 300, $350 Yeti next to Chris's redneck cooler, which is just, a- <laughs> which worked just as well as your Yeti. I'm sure it did. <laughs> I don't know about that, but it did. Sure the beers were cold. In the context that's, of that's that all that matters. That's, that's all that matters. That is the all beers that matters. That's all that matters. <laughs> well, Spring game on Saturday. Let's dive into it. Uh, First thing I want to talk about, uh, obviously, the team's not split super evenly. Uh, The Maroon team seemed to have a lot of the first stringers, at least on offense. What do you guys think of that dynamic? Do you think it would be better to have more evenly matched teams or get to see what maybe the first string is going to look like next year? Well, you know, Price said before the game that he thought the teams were evenly split. Now, their performance levels did not indicate it dur- during the game. But at the same time, like, you know, Jaden Blue, who I view is probably Tech's number one receiver, he was on, uh, he was on, Jason, team, he was on Jason Brown's team. Yeah. And the chance he got, which would have gone for a big gain down the sideline, he was wide open, he dropped. You know, and, and he hadn't been dropping that throughout the course of the spring. So I didn't think uh, Brown's offensive line performed well. Um, and obviously – probably mentioned that after the game i don't know it's, it's one of those things where on paper maybe you look at it before the game and, and you say yeah okay so this team has a little bit better receivers but they're also going up against you know the starting safeties and shamari connor and, yeah. and the starting nickel and Breon murray even though he had to play a different position yeah for, for the spring game um but the, my main takeaway from the spring game, as always, is you can't take much out of the spring <laughs> game i mean you can identify some physical attributes 
like Grant Wells obviously has the arm. Caleb Smith's speed, uh, yes, which Some, something we hadn't not, seen not, before. Not, not expecting, but uh, for the most part, though, it just validated the things we already knew. I think, and it was more about the overall day and experience than the actual performance. Yeah, yeah I, and I think the way they broke the teams down. So the Maroon team had the starting center in Johnny Jordan and then the starting tackles. Mm -hmm. And the white team had the starting guard. So they mm -hmm. had uh, Jesse Hansen and Caden Moore. So, you know, it's three starters to two starters. And, you know, but I, I mean, I think the teams were fairly – even it just you know when when you don't have as good of his offensive line it kind of hurts a little bit and, and to be fair you know the white defense had Jamari Connor Breon Murray it had some talent you know it has a lot of some starters on the back end you know but like Breon Murray got beat twice you know on those deep balls to Caleb Smith Jamari Connor got his ankles broken by the Jalen Jones you know like you know I, I think they were fairly even teams Maroon just kind of outperformed and the Maroon defense was. Was that that front, um, like Wilfred Panay, especially him and, yeah. and Josh Fuga? You know, they're not the starter, the starting tackles, but that they really the Fuga probably will be this year. Yeah, but I mean, potentially him. I yeah. mean, it's kind of him, Kendricks Pollard. You know, but um, you know, but that mix up, up front for the Maroon defense kind of um, overpowered the white offensive line. But I thought overall, you know. Not a whole lot you can take away, kind of like what Chris said, but, you know, Grant Wells showed out, and, um, you know, I, I think it was kind of interesting late in the game to kind of see who was getting reps because, again, as I'm sure we'll talk about, Tech has to get below the scholarship limit, and there's <laughs> yeah. some guys that are going to have to go other places. So I'm sitting there writing my, my scholarship article yes, uh, yesterday, I guess. And uh, yeah, it was yesterday when the yes. Transfer Portal season yes. yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, officially yeah. began, I guess. Um, so I, I just finished the running backs and the tight ends, and Jordan Brunson entered the portal, and I literally just finished typing. Jordan Brunson didn't get a single carry in the spring game, so he yeah. might be a name to keep an eye on for the transfer <laughs> portal. And then I got to the tight end section, and I said, Jared Gibble was falling behind true freshman Harrison St. Germain, maybe even walk on Ty Eller. So maybe the writing's on the wall there. And I saved the article and was about to go to the gym, and then those guys entered the transfer <laughs> portal. And I was like, oh, God, I got to go ahead. Oh, I just want to jump in and give props to Jordan Brunson for saying uh, that he was glad to be a part of things here in Blacksburg. <laughs> Instead Not of a part. A, a part. part. <laughs> so he gets bonus points for that. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm that guy. I believe Brunson, he's already found a new home, right? Miami, 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 Miami Ohio. Ohio. So Action. that means he had been talking to them for a while. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, you mentioned Grant Wells. Let's talk about him a little bit. Obviously, still some work to do over the summer and the fall, but it felt like he was he's going to be the pretty clear-cut quarterback one. It was at halftime, I believe. The Maroon team had 10 first downs, and the white team had zero. Uh, yeah. He had almost 200 passing yards. It, it seems like he's the guy for, for the Hokies. I mean, that's what I expected. Yeah. He's, he's the more accomplished quarterback. Yeah. Um, and I know Jason Brown started four games for South Carolina and they beat Florida during that stretch, but Florida stunk this past year, you know, and the bottom line is, you know, he was for most of his career at South Carolina, he was third string, right? Um, I think he is a quality, quality backup for Virginia Tech. Uh, he's got a good arm. Uh, he grew up a Tech fan. He wants to be here, but I, I think there's no question that Grant Wells is the best option as a starting quarterback. Uh, I just think he does a little things more fluidly. He uh, seems to get through his progressions better. Um, I want to say his deep ball is smoother th than Brown's. Uh, I think their arm strength, per se, is kind of similar, but I, I think uh, well, Wells' arm is a little more dynamic, if that makes any sense. Um, he's also a better athlete. Um, he's not going to sit there and, and you know rush for Braxton Burmeister 100, 100 yard games at times and things like that. He had a, he is a competent runner. Like yeah, he's very similar to Ryan Willis. Yes, very very similar physically. Scramble and, and can pick up pick up chunks of yards. Yeah, absolutely. And arm strength is very similar. And Ryan Willis ended this past season with the with the Chicago, Chicago Bears. Bears, which is insane when you consider he ended his Virginia Tech career as the third string quarterback. <laughs> and so I think that says a little bit more about Virginia Tech, though, than that does Ryan Willis. But, uh, yeah, I mean, and the other thing about Wells is, you know, he's a two-year starter at Marshall, but one of those years didn't count towards his eligibility he's because of COVID. Three he's got three years left if he wants them, if he, if he wants three. You know, so worst-case scenario, he's the starter this year and next year. 
best case scenario is he's the starter for 22, 23, and 24. And so it just makes sense that I'm tired of quarterback turnover at Virginia yeah. Tech, a new starter every year. You know, so let's just, you know, if Jason Brown comes out in August and is better, then by all means yeah. start him. But but if it's anything close to, you know, even, then you got to go with Wells and, and just assume that he's going to, I think he's a good player now, a talented player now, but assume that he's going to get better as he continues to pick up the offense and continues to establish a rapport with the wide receivers. Uh, it, it just seems like the right thing to do. I think it's the right short-term decision and the right long-term decision for Tech. Yeah. I was going to say, um, the last Tech quarterback to start two full seasons in a row was Logan Thomas. So that, that goes to show seasons. you – you know, yeah, well, it would have been Brewer, and it would have been Brewer, hurt. but and it would have been hurt. Jackson, but he got hurt. Yeah, but yeah. so, so, but that just goes to show you that there's been qu- quarterback turnover for mm-hmm. the past decade, right? Um, but yeah, and, I, and another thing to point out, Jason Brown, you know, and, and he took a lot of the heat. I say heat post game, um, you know, when when he was asked about, okay, did the you know did the offensive line not playing well? Did that hurt? You know, did that hurt you? And he ultimately was like, well, you know, I need to still get the ball out quicker i need to be better in that situation and while he didn't have the best showing you have to remember that you know the, the all the coaching staff they got to see him you know through the entire spring it's not like this was the first time they saw him you yeah, know they yeah, right they've seen what <laughs> him up against wells the entire spring yeah. and i think to chris's point wells is just a better option um but but kind of what i wrote about after the game on saturday was and they they both quarterbacks and, and Brent Pry all took some questions about it about after the game. Tech has two competent quarterbacks. I think that's that's a good thing. Mm-hmm. You know, if for some reason and, and Jason Brown mentioned this, like South Carolina when he was there last year used three different quarterbacks right. because two of them got hurt and he was a third string guy and he came in. Who knows if Grant Wells with, with the the luck that Virginia Tech has had with with quarterbacks <laughs> and getting injured in the past decade, there's a good chance that. Grant, you know, Grant Wells, if he's the starter, is going to, you know, Jason Brown's going to have to come in at some, some point. point. And it's good to have a backup opposed to, you know, last season where it was the guy who's currently at San Diego State and then the McNeese State starting quarterback. And yeah. your super slot receiver for this year, Connor Bummer. <laughs> yeah. Right? That yeah. is your quarterback. Yeah. Option. So it's, it's, a, it's, I think it's a lot better. And, and the good news is, um, and one of the things I think that hasn't really been talked about a lot, but it, it's Brad Glenn. He's a quarterback only coach. He's not an offensive coordinator. Yeah. And he, he actually told the media, like, I love being just a quarterback's coach because I can sit down and dedicate all my time to working with these quarterbacks instead of having to deal with play calling and all that stuff. So you got to think, you know, yes, they're, they're all learning a new system, but, um, you know, Grant Wells is essentially, if he ends up becoming the starter, which, it, it would not surprise me if he does. Um, you know, I know they're taking the competition into the fall, but he essentially gets to sit down and work with Brad Glenn all summer, you know, all fall camp, preparing for that season. And it's not like, you know, Glenn's attention is going to be elsewhere. I think who knows how good Wells is going to be this upcoming year, but I think you know, he's got three years left, and he has a bright future ahead of him. And it, assuming he is the guy, you know, Tech will be in really good hands with Brown behind him. Yeah, I think so, too. I agree with you 100%. Uh, you're talking about a guy who already has two years of starting experience, could eventually play for three more years. I think he's a level-headed guy. He's already engaged. Yeah. Guys who get engaged, you know, they're going to think about things a little bit differently. Certain things are going to be more important to them and things like that. So uh, I, uh, I'm on board with that. Um, like I said, if Jason Brown comes out in August and beats him out, then by all means start Jason yeah. Brown. I just don't think there's a very high likelihood of that happening. Well, let's keep looking at quarterbacks here. Later on in the game, in the second half, we got to see Taj Bullock a little bit and the first sighting of Devin Farrell. It seems like both those guys developing well running the ball. They both ran the ball really <laughs> they well. They didn't, the ball much. Well, you didn't throw the ball very much. Four <laughs> attempts for Bullock and one for Farrell, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, they they didn't let him uh, throw the ball much, and and you know maybe that's for for the best uh, as they get their feet wet and things like that. And they, they also at that point, you know, the top receivers were out of the game yes. too, and so you're they were there were a lot of walk on receivers. I mean, to be fair, the the touchdown for the white team was Ben Locklear throwing right. to Connor Dusenberry, right. a walk on to a walk on <laughs> against walk on defenders, wearing possibly, number ninety seven, you know? right? Yes, so. <laughs> 
<laughs> When's the last time a ninety something scored a touchdown for Virginia Tech? Yeah, That's a good know. question. But but yeah, I mean I think I don't know. I mean I, I know Chris feels the same way. Like there's no reason not to redshirt Devin Farrell this year. Yeah. Um listen, I I know he's battling it out. Boom, boom, boom. <laughs> put it up. Um there I know I know that they're they're gonna have a competition for the third quarterback spot, but the thing to me is if you get down to your third quarterback, you're 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 not gonna have a good result anyway. <laughs> so just do what's best for the actual player in that perspective, and and that's and that's red shirt. And, and worst case, if Tech had had to get down to the third quarterback, why would you not use Connor Blumrick? Uh you know that that that, that you could. That's an, that, I mean that's an that's an but, option. Right, well, you, you, situation. I mean, to me, I th- actually think. Blumberg's going to be one of Tech's top targets oh, no, this I, year. I, I so, agree. So I, was saying, like, I think by moving him to qu- back to quarterback, it's not it's not like he can throw it to himself, well, right? So I actually think it makes it might make their offense worse if they moved him back because it would take away one of their top targets. Um, so I would roll with Bullock in that case. But at any rate, it doesn't matter because I don't think you can win consistently with your third yeah. quarterback anyway. So I, 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 th- I think it's setting up well for Tech. I mean, to have – Two guys like Wells and Brown at the top of the depth chart, and you can develop those guys behind them. And here's what I, you've got, and I've pointed this out several times, but I want to emphasize it today that uh, Todd Bullock is behind from a de- developmental standpoint because in high school, he was behind another FBS quarterback for his first two years. The guy went to Navy. So T- Todd couldn't start till his junior year of high school. Sometimes that's how it works in that New Jersey Catholic League, which is a really talented league. And then his junior year, he had a good year. And then going from his junior year to his senior year, his whole offseason of development got wrecked by COVID. Absolutely wrecked. You know, they were not, not allowed to do anything. No offseason practice work, no drill. And when they finally got around to playing their senior season, I think it only lasted six games. So this is a guy who like only started 17 games in high school because he was behind an F, another FBS quarterback and then COVID. So he did not get a full high school career full of development before he enrolled at Virginia Tech. So, you know, he needs, you know, to be cooked some more. So he needs as much time as as they can right. de- develop Fair get him in the weight room, Fair. but but also just develop just, those skills without yeah. having to worry about him going, going out into a game. and and, right. and I think having that uh, having two capable guys it, it can relieve some stress where he doesn't feel like he has to develop really, right. really fast. Yes. Right, and Farrell, Farrell was, was in Georgia, and obviously the COVID rules were a little bit different in Georgia than I'm sure they were in New Jersey. He got a full senior season in. I doubt his – I'm sure his offseason was impacted to a certain extent between like his you know, junior, senior year all that, and all that, but uh, he was also one year later. You know, so he, it was less of an impact. So his development was not quite as impacted as Bullock's was, uh, you know, because of the COVID thing. So it's a little bit unfortunate f- for Bullock, uh, but like he is behind because of all that, and that's bad luck for him. But uh, I, I, yes, he looks the part, and he's got the arm strength and, and, and everything like that. But he's a guy because of the, those circumstances. You're talking; it's not like he was a five-star recruit or a four-star recruit. He was a regular three-star recruit. A good prospect, to be sure, but a regular three-star recruit who did not get adequate development time at the high school level because of COVID. So you have to be patient with him. And I know telling people to be patient about football players these days (laughs) isn't going to work, but I feel the need to say it anyway. Well, let's talk targets here. Wide receiver was one of the question marks heading into this season. A lot of guys leaving, but Caleb Smith really stood out. He had two really big plays. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was up in the booth uh, with Bill Roth for the broadcast helping out, and I was looking up Caleb Smith's stats, and he he only had two touchdowns all last year. He had two (laughs) touchdowns in the first quarter of the spring game. Yeah, when I think he's... Each year, Caleb Smith has been here. Remember, this is a guy originally committed to Wake Forest mm-hmm. on scholarship and then accepted the preferred walk-on spot at Virginia Tech and had to earn a scholarship here. And he was good enough, but it just took some time. But he's kind of always overshadowed, I feel like, by bigger receivers. Last year, Trey Turner, Tavion Robinson. Caleb Smith was the third guy. You can go back and back to when Damon Hazleton was here. This year, he's the you know, before Jaden Blue committed. He was the guy, the most and, experienced and, guy. and now Jaden Blue's here, and, and it's kind of those two. And while you didn't get to see shades of Jaden Blue uh, on, at the spring game, 
you did get to see Caleb Smith, and this is a guy who, you know, I mean, he could have gone somewhere else if he really wanted to sure. and, and played, but, you know, he's. I think he's really taking a step over the offseason, and, you know, that speed, I think, was, was kind of surprising, but, um, you know, I think those two plays, those deep balls, I think it was 47-yard touchdown, a 51-yard touchdown. Yeah. I mean... If Caleb Smith can can produce like that, you know, and that was, I mean, that was Breon Murray and Jamari Connor he was beating. It's yeah. not like it's not like they were. They're, they're not backups. They're now, not, I, I will say this: coverage is not the strong suit of either one of them. That is guys. true. Yes. yes. Um, like Jamari Connor, you know, when it, whenever he played whip in the past, you know, when, whenever he had to play man defense, you know, he he he'd have some struggles, particularly against uh, what's his face at UNC. UNC. Uh, uh, Newsom. Newsom. Yeah, Newsom. Yeah. Uh, and. You know, Breon Murray, when Tech recruited him out of JUCO, he was more of a safety type in JUCO, and he was kind of pressed into service as a cornerback. He's been playing that nickel role all spring, but simply purely because of numbers, he and DJ Harvey, the other nickel, yeah. were actual cornerbacks and uh, during the spring game. So he was out there in a role that he hadn't really practiced very much this spring, and I don't think he's really suited for anyway. Um, but at the same time, like, I... Uh, I do worry about cornerback depth because he might have to play it, and I just don't think, you know, downfield coverage on receivers is his strong suit. Yeah. Um, but I feel like just in general, like it, seeing Caleb Smith dust some defenders, right. catch some long right. balls, you get to see what Grant Wells can do. But you also get, you know, feel a little bit better. I think a lot of people were kind of just like, okay, like Caleb Smith's a guy who's been in the program but hasn't scored a lot. What do we, we don't know what we have, and then he goes out and scores two touchdowns right. in the first quarter. And it's like, all right, like. We might, you know, be on to something. I mean, he does. He like I don't know what his forty time is. Schools don't release stuff like that any these days. But like he does, he doesn't look fast because yes. of his build, right? And uh, so, so you know, maybe maybe it was pure speed. Maybe it was technique. Maybe it was poor plays by by the defensive backs. But at the same time, I, I said before spring practice started that I'm not worried about Tech's quarterbacks because I thought Grant Wells could make any throw on the field. It was just a matter of whether when he made the throw, whether the wide receiver would actually be there or not. And it was good to see a wide receiver there when he made a couple of uh, throws that guys on Sundays can make. And Caleb Smith, it, you look back at his time here, it felt like he was the guy who would get you seven on third and six. Yes. That, that right. was who he was. <laughs> If he can develop into a deep threat, maybe another layer to the offense. Uh, and we also saw some emergence of Dwayne Lofton and Jalen Jones both had a few catches. So very happy to see Jalen uh, Jones make that move in the open yep. field, even if it was against Jamar Connor. Uh, <laughs> again, like, uh, <laughs> oh, 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 like I, I do have some concerns. Well, are we going to talk about defense later? Oh, or? of course. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I will say that I feel better about the receivers right now than I did before the spring. Yep. Yeah. Um, part of that is like moving Bloomrick. I, he was listed on, as a tight end on the spring game roster. He's playing I, in the slot. I, I listed him as a tight end yesterday, but just whatever. But I, I think he'll line up in the slot more times than not. Uh, Tech's offense this year, I think, will be kind of inverted what you, from what you would normally think of an offense. Normally, you think the six five guy is going to be the outside receiver, and Dwayne Lofton, the five eleven guy, is going to be the slot re receiver, right? And I think it's going to be inverted this year for Tech and, uh, because I think uh, a guy like uh, Connor is a guy who I don't think a traditional linebacker can match him in athleticism and coverage. But he's going to be so much bigger than any nickelback. Imagine so, trying to put him up against. Imagine him running at DJ Harvey or Brian Murray, right. and then Dax Hall if you right, right. at the same time. And then if you want to run the ball, blocking them yeah. too. You know, as far as uh, defensive backs goes. So Brent Pry is looking that at that from the eyes of, of a defensive coordinator. If there's a guy like uh, like Connor Blumrick that they're going to line up, that the other team is going to line up in the slot all the time, and it's third and eight. Okay, do you go with your nickel package? And put a smaller guy on him that he can out jump and out physical, or do you go with a linebacker who can outrun, who Connor can outrun, yeah. right? So I, that's why I think he's going to be primarily a slot for Virginia Tech this year. And as strange as it sounds, you're going to see Lofton on on the outside a lot. Yeah, but I think I think just in general, I didn't get to see much out of Jaden Blue. But I I think the wide receiver room as a whole throw Connor Blomberg into the mix. I think. Right. I think it's just going to be a question of, you know, can they find that consistency of the younger guys, that, that Jalen Jones, that da Dallin Wright, mm -hmm. uh, the Dwayne Lofton, right. that kind of group of guys, the young redshirt freshmen or sophomores, I guess, that group, 
the guys that need to develop a little bit more, who's going to stand out of that group? Yeah, and you've got somebody, and I don't know if this is Caleb Smith based on the spring game or if it's somebody else. Like You're going to have to be able to generate some big plays down the field. Otherwise, all that arm talent of Grant Wells is somewhat wasted. Yeah. Well, we've talked a little bit about the defense, but let's dive into the other side of the ball now. We got to see Brent Price scheme a little bit, how guys are adjusting to some new positions. What stood out to you on the other side of the ball on Saturday? Um, I, I thought I think Tech, I feel better about defensive tackle because of the development of Wilford Panay. Agreed. Um, I saw a picture of him next to uh, Norrell Pollard uh, either this morning or yesterday. And Pollard's listed at 281. Um, and Panay is listed at 253. That's an old weight for Panay. That dude is way bigger than 253 now. He's gotten a lot bigger. And I think he, he's an athletic guy. He's a guy who practices kickboxing in his spare time. I mean, you look at his Instagram videos, and he's getting his foot up there all the way to the top of the bag, you know, in his kickboxing stuff. So he's a very flexible guy, and he's a big guy, and he's an athletic guy. And I think he's a great fit for defensive tackle in the Pry scheme. I think he would have been a great fit for defensive tackle in the Bud Foster scheme. I don't think he was a great fit in the Justin Hamilton scheme. So I, th I think him and Pollard are, are really going to benefit for, from the scheme change. Uh, I don't know that, that Fuga is uh, quite as good a fit, but I think he's overall the most, maybe the overall most physically talented yeah. in that group. And I know he works extremely hard. Um, he, so he was the defensive most Im improved, improved play, right, player right, from right. the spring. So uh, that, that's a good sign. And Kendrick's missed the whole spring coming off an injury. But, you know, if he can come back and, and improve a little bit, He's probably a little bit better for 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 the scheme too. Then, uh, you know, I think you've got four defensive tackles there that, that that will play pretty well, especially since you know several of them are better fits for this scheme than the old. Yeah, I think overall defensive. If you just talking about the defensive line, I, I think it's going to be something that we're going to mention a lot. But like the first, the, the two deep is is fairly strong up, up front, defensive end and tackle. Behind them, you know, young guys need to develop a little more. But but like Taiwan Garbett's pretty good. Cole Nelson didn't play, but I think but, he's a good player. But Cole yeah. Nelson's going to be pretty good. Jalen Griffin, he's experienced. You bring in Payne in from Nebraska, and you bring in Payne from Nebraska. So uh, there's probably not like a dominant, not dominant all ACC player yeah. there. But you should you, you should, like be to, should be able to get you should be able to get some right. from some pressure right. from from that front. <sighs> Um, and I think just at, at linebacker in general, I don't think anything really jumped out nah. because both sides didn't really run the ball at all. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. I, I, I don't know what the total rush yards for either side was, but it wasn't much at all. White was in the negative for a majority of the yeah. game. That includes sacks, but yeah. a lot of it was quarterback runs. Yeah, so I don't know. I don't think anything else really like jumped out to me about the linebackers or the DBs, mm -hmm. but I think it was interesting kind of just to see where guys were, were playing and, and kind of what backups got to see playing time. Because I think a guy right. like Jaden Keller is, you know, pushing a little bit at wit at will, whether he'll play is uh, you know, he, to be determined. I think he but will he's, because Brent Pry has a history of rotating linebackers. But he's, he's going to be really good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, he certainly looks the part. I will, I'll say my bit. I think my biggest concern right now is kind of depth in the back end, um, particularly at corner. Like if Dorian Strong or Armani Chapman got hurt, who would they put at corner? I mean, I think you probably either move Breon Murray or DJ Har Harvey from nickel back to corner, and then the other stays at, at the at the nickel spot yeah. um, for long yardage and third down situations and things like that. So. Which one of those two guys do you move to corner? It's going to come down to which one is trusted most by the coaching staff. I, you know, uh, I will say that Breon Murray at Virginia Tech, he played about 100 snaps, a little over 100 snaps in 2019 and graded out well. He played at a little over 100 snaps last year and graded out okay, pretty well. It's when he had to play like over 500 snaps in 2020 as a corner where he had a poor season, graded out in the 40s. So I don't think you want him on the field in a starting role every snap of a game. So I would lean towards DJ, moving DJ Harvey to one of those. Yeah, but you just hope you don't. And, then, and that's where the transfer portal comes yeah. in. I mean, I think that right. – I think – corner is going to be one of those positions where it's like if you can get if you can get yeah. a, not necessarily like a guy that, that can come in and give you really good minutes 
start oh, hopefully and, and still and still piece. has eligibility left maybe. yes right right yeah, yeah. I, I so if you can get a sophomore who's maybe played some and you feel like he's a better option yeah uh, yeah you know then that's that's something you could potentially pursue uh i thought nike uh nike hawkins had a good uh yeah. good, good spring game had a couple of really nice open field tackles uh which you didn't see i mean what stood out to me is Jamari Connor missing that open field tackle and Nike, Nike, Nike Hawkins, Hawkins making, making it. Two. Yeah. yeah, so uh, I, I was impressed with him. Um, and again, but Brent Pry talks about the safety spots is, is something that he could uh, potentially look at in the transfer portal as well. So I don't think he's entirely pleased there. Um, so we'll see. I mean, it's easy to say, oh, yeah, you're definitely going to take a safety. Well, do you, I don't think it's definite. Simply, well, I think it, I think it all comes who's, down. So who's available? Yeah, I think right. it. I was gonna say. I think it all comes down to to who's available. I mean, right. clearly I, they will. The staff will, and I say this in parentheses, make room. But like, they're over the scholarship limit right now. Yeah. You know, you add somebody. Okay, that's just one more pro- player that's leaving. Right, and so to switch it back to offense, very very quickly, another transfer portal. This would be my number one priority actually in the transfer portal is an offensive lineman. Yes. I would especially like a true offensive tackle because, like, D- Janzi's right now is the left tackle, and I'm not even sure I would consider him a true offensive yeah, tackle. Yeah, he's probably more comfortable right? at guard. Right, yeah. Uh, so, like, I-, I would love to find a true offensive tackle that, that it can either provide depth or actually start, which allows Janzi to move inside uh, to, to left guard, I think. I think that would make Tech a stronger offensive line as a whole. Um preferably someone with multiple years, years remaining too yeah. that that would be ideal so if we were going to do like a big board like they do on draft night <laughs> mo- top three needs for virginia tech would be what offensive line corner what would be your third hmm what do you think offensive line. i think it would just for my third spot best available <laughs> well d- d- it, d- it depends on the position like if like like Maybe uh, if your best available is a quarterback, you don't want to add another well, quarterback, yeah. right? Yeah, uh, you got a billion running backs. You don't want to add another <laughs> one unless you find Khalil Herbert. Yeah. Um. Otherwise, you're just you're just adding another body to the mix. Yeah. You don't need bodies at running maybe back. Maybe 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 safety. Yeah, yeah. Or a wide receiver. Right. Uh, yeah. yeah. Depending on the type of wide receiver, I guess, and things like that. But you know, there's, there's, K, uh, well, there's KJ K, is KJ right? Uh, uh, is that the South, the South, Carolina, the South Carolina guy? Carolina guy yeah. uh, he, uh, is that his name? I, th- I believe so. Yeah, KJ Wright. Yeah, went well, to, well went you're, to, you're in the fourth chair. You have to look this up. Yeah, for KJ us. Wright. <laughs> went to Chancellor. Uh, went to the same went Chancellor High School. Six, then went in Saint, to Saint Francis. Six, and then went seven, to two forty. South Carolina sounds like a tight end, right? But when he when he was at South Carolina, he. Hardly ever. He's Bucky Hodges. Yeah. You know, he, he has the size of a tight end, but he actually played wide receiver. Now, he's caught like only caught seven or eight passes last year, I think. But he did play over 200 snaps. That's kind of like and, Steven Guys now a little right, bit, too. Yeah. Uh, so, I, I think uh, he's a guy that could potentially help, but, like, he would not come in and, like, start. So, uh, are you guys talking about EJ Jenkins? Yes. Oh. Yes. Yeah. K- yeah. Oh, I said KJ. KJ, EJ, okay. Wright, yeah. Jenkins. You yeah. Know. KJ, yeah. KJ Wright was a longtime linebacker for the Seahawks, I believe. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> well, okay. Um, so, he's in South Carolina has a couple of defensive linemen in the portal. But, Jenkins. You know, right. yeah, and, that's uh, him. Oh, apologies. We should also mention that R.J. Adams from Kentucky, an interior offensive lineman, has also entered. The transfer portal. Uh, I think Fugo retweeted that last right, night, yeah. right? And RJ Adams was a guy. He was a top fifteen player in the state of Virginia coming out of uh, high school, and I think he's listed with something like twenty seven offers. I mean, he's listed with an Alabama offer. Now, what is an offer these days? Committable offer, uncommittable, blah blah blah. But he had a nice big offer list, and he's in the portal. He's from Woodbridge, Virginia. He's not an offensive tackle, but uh, you know, I think Virginia Tech has four starters set. Um, if he's a guy that could come in and compete, he's got four years it's, of eligibility. It, it, it's remaining. like the whole right side of the offensive line is set, right? And it's just kind of figuring out. I th- I think could R.J. Adams come in and potentially compete uh, for the left guard spot? Yes, um, yeah. and finding yeah. where where Silas Janzi fits right. the best. Right, going to be interesting over the next couple of weeks. Could see some players in. Surely going to see some players going oh, out. We saw two yesterday. Two yesterday, and Chris has a good article up on Tech Sideline talking I mean, about the roster squeeze yeah. down to 85. We'll see how that works out. 
Um, and David, bringing up draft night, I'm I'm gonna think of something fun to do for the draft next week. Uh, is that next week? Here. Draft is eight days from today. The NFL draft. So uh, we'll we'll talk about that next week. I'll I'll come up with something fun to make you guys draft stuff. Um, before we move on, uh, let's talk a little special teams. Some some mistakes in there, and uh, when Oscar Shadley moves on after he's gone, I believe yeah, correct. He is gone yeah. after his twelfth year at Virginia Tech. Uh, <laughs> we already saw some issues. Snap over the head of the punter. Yeah. Uh, Which long snapper was that? I don't know, I'm but I, sure I, I because there's three on the roster, right. so I'm not sure if it was uh, the Enzo Anthony, the UVA transfer, the former UVA transfer, or one of the other two walk-ons. But, yeah, but. Yeah, but oh, we got to see a lot of punts. Yes, lots of punts, There's, and we got to see a lot of good punts. Thirteen, even, of them. For, even from the backup punter. Did you see there was the one punt, and I tweeted this. Peter Moore caught it, slipped, and then nailed a sixty-one yard punt, <laughs> <Yeah. long. laughs> yeah. crushed it. And it's just like, what in the world, yeah. man? But he, I didn't he had one go off the side of his foot. But outside of that, I think it was almost yeah. perfect from Peter Moore. Yeah, it was pretty good. And yeah. you got to see uh, some of the kickers right. perform. Now, 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 Peter Moore is one of those guys. I'm not sure if he's on scholarship or not because he was not a recruited scholarship player. Yeah. And it was always Beamer's policy in the past where, you know, your starting punter, your starting kicker, they're scholarship guys. You put them on scholarship even if they were recruited as walk-ons. Um, you got to be very, very careful because, like, We've seen like Virginia Tech lose Jordan Stout to Penn State because Penn State put him on scholarship. And at that point, Tech already had a punter and a kicker on scholarship, and do you want to use a third scholarship on, on yeah. a kicker? Um, uh, is, in the end, you know, it worked out fine for Tech because Tech had plenty of good kickers and things like that. But like, if Peter Moore is not on scholarship, he needs to be. Yeah. Because anybody who needs a punter is going to hit that dude up this summer and say, hey, are you on scholarship? And when he says no, they're going to offer him a full scholarship. <laughs> and that's really hard to turn down if you're not on scholarship. Yeah, he's already. the only yeah. – He's the. he was a third-team All-ACC performer right. last year. Right. He's the only returner to Virginia Tech that like earned All-ACC honors. He's right. the only one. Right. And he's so he has to be on scholarship. Yeah. If he's not right now, he needs to be starting the summer. Yeah. Well, let's talk kickers a little bit. Uh, <laughs> some competition there as well. John Love, I believe, was the freshman. He had, yes. he's, and he's a recruited scholarship player. Yes. From what we understand. Yeah. And then William Ross, is that the other? Yeah. Uh, one the, one the hit a 38-yarder, one hit a 39-yarder. Where did Ross tra- Was he the South Carolina transfer? Um, uh, you were uh, Coastal Carolina. Coastal That's Carolina. Oh, no, I think he went to South Carolina, then Coastal Carolina, okay. and now Virginia Tech. Yeah. He's a well-traveled kicker. <laughs> what's, his, uh, what's his first name? Uh, William? William Ross, yeah. All right. uh, I, and I think, you know, kind of weird because Virginia Tech's had this thing both at punter and kicker the past couple of years where, I mean, before Peter Moore came in, it was Oscar Bradburn, it was – Brian Johnson and John Parker Romo for multiple years, and, yeah. and you had that stability, and now it's just like, who's your kicker going to be? Yeah, but you know, but I will say that uh, at one point that was Brian Johnson, right? Who's your true. kicker yeah. going to be after Joey Sly? Right, yeah, and, right, yeah. and then it turned out Brian Johnson was pretty darn good and has played in the NFL. So, <laughs> right, um, so I, I'm, I'm not going to say I'm not concerned, yeah, but I'm not going to sit around and let it worry me uh, until. Until games start, and if those guys show they can't do it, then yeah. I'll be worried. Well, you remember, but, I mean, last year, uh, it was the West Virginia game or the Notre Dame game, one of the two. I sat on the set, and I mentioned that I thought Tech was – I think it was the Notre Dame game. I thought Tech was going to lose because – I think it was Notre Dame. John Parker Romo wasn't going to be able to hit a field goal. <laughs> because remember, he, he missed that, that short – he had missed earlier. Yeah, and, he, and then yeah. he ended up – Drilling him. And then from – from the game he missed, was it the West? He might have been the West Virginia game he missed. Right. From one of the games he missed, from then on, he yeah. was great yeah. last year. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, I'm sure they'll they'll find no, they'll stability at kicker. Stu Holt no. is going to work his magic. Let's give. I have no clue about Stu Holt as far as developing kickers, but he's not here anymore. But let's give credit where credit is due. James Shebus is a heck of, was a heck of a good oh, yeah. special teams yeah. coach. And that guy's got a pipeline to the NFL now. I mean, Joey Sly, uh, Brian Johnson's played in the NFL. Uh, they had Bradbury's multiple kickers probably at, got the leg strength, too. Yeah, they had multiple just kickers at Memphis. Spots. Yeah, right, right. Uh, just He's awesome at develop, developing kickers, and I hope we don't miss that. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see how that all shakes out heading into the fall. Anything else on the spring game that you guys want to hit on? Uh, good, I thought it was a good, ma- good atmosphere. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, and, and a lot of people back in town. I would guess, you know, 25,000 people were there, something like that. And the, the thing is, since baseball and softball were going on at the same time, there were great crowds at both of those games. Yes. <laughs> it actually probably hurt the spring game attendance yeah. a little bit. Yeah. Well, I mean, I walked over to baseball, and it wasn't completely full, but it was a really good crowd. Mm. Then I walked over to softball. That place was packed, and and because they had Beamer Way blocked off, I mean, they were, the the overflow like into the street, like standing on <laughs> in the outfield yeah. of the so softball I, I, I park think was they should, awesome. I think they should stagger if they get that event next year, and they happen to have softball and baseball at home yeah. on the same weekend as the spring game. I think they need to stagger it. Of course, especially because Tech has no control well, over what time the spring game starts because it's on the it's ACC on the network. Yeah, yeah. Right? but especially but, because baseball and softball weren't even televised. Right, yes. right. So Tech did have control over those starts. So I would start one. I would start like the the softball game at like one, and it'll definitely be over by the time a four o'clock spring game starts. And then I'd have baseball play a night game. Yeah, play seven, seven, o'clock. Was seven, o'clock. seven o'clock at yeah, night. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That may, may way you make it a all, all day event, right, right? And and it maximizes your attendance at all of them. I yeah, think. yeah, yeah. It would for baseball especially. The game starts at two. You're probably only watching half the you're game the before six, you have to head six to the spring game. Exactly. So. Yeah. All right, well, definitely great atmosphere uh, and uh, a lot of alumni back in town. Uh, Tyrod Taylor was on the ACC Network broadcast. Um, they showed, I want to say, Cam Chancellor, both Edmonds brothers. Yeah, when, uh, and when we t- mentioned the spring jam again, all those guys, uh, that was one of the really cool things, was mm-hmm. all those guys were just there. The Edmonds brothers, yeah. all four Fuller brothers were in town. Wow. Yeah. Um, uh, both Cam the Ch- DBs, Cam Chancellor, Cam Chancellor Wyatt, D'Angelo Hall, Wyatt Teller, James Anderson, Wyatt Teller. Uh, Ike Charlton was there. Shane Graham. Go back to the 90s. Michael Stewie was there, the wide receiver. We talked to him quite a bit. Shane Graham was there. Uh, I don't want to leave anybody out, but how there were so many. I mean, it was just to, like yeah, yeah, it was a ton it, of them. It was, it was insane, though. And I think that was Aaron Rouse. Um, yes, Aaron Rouse I, was I think there. there were – Chris Ellis. Yeah, I mean, and they did – I think they did uh, They did like a professional development night one of the nights before mm-hmm. and had some of those guys – I know Aaron Rouse – you know, Virginia Beach Councilman came and, and spoke. Um, and I think Brunt Pry and the staff just kind of get it. And I know that that event was put on by the Sons of Saturday, but the fact that, like, like Brad Worthman and Evan Massingill from the Hokie Club were there. Yeah, you know, uh, like, well, I-, I talked to the Sons of Saturday guys there. They they, they invited us to it and, yeah. and everything like that. So we had a good time, and we appreciate that. And, you know, one of the Sons of Saturday guys told me that the athletic department – did a great job of helping, helping them yeah. put put the event on, like the event planners and people behind the scenes in the athletic department, whose names will never like your average <laughs> tech fan doesn't even know they exist. They yeah. they they did a really good job organizing all that uh, as far as like getting the former players there and things like that. So it seems to be a. Uh, so everybody was pulling in the same direction. It's an emphasis. Right. It's an emphasis. Right. And yeah. I mean, they had the, they had the all day golf event. I think yes. before that, so there was a lot of a lot of cool stuff with former players. I don't think uh, uh, Sean Glennon was at the thing, but I saw the picture with Sean Glennon Sean and Tyrod Glenn next to each other. Oh, well, they were go- they were golf partners. Yeah. yeah. So um, you know, just cool things like that. I think you know that's the most alum that alumni football alumni that have ever been in town and, and together at the same time in a really long time so and i think billy ray mitchell told me that uh you know he, he sat down and chatted with some of the guys like before they put this together and one of the big things was you know a lot of the time when when athletics asks you to come back you know together it's hey come back let's get a picture and then that's it right and like they wanted to create an event where everybody could come sit down and and chat and hang out and catch up mm. and that's what they did and i thought it went really really well and the fans you know people could pay what like 10 bucks and, yeah. and walk in and you know buy drinks for player you know former players <laughs> and chat them up and i mean i saw plenty of people you know getting like football signed and stuff there were some so. recruits there too like i saw rashad pernell there. wow yeah. yeah so it was really cool well, I know that was a question Will wanted to ask, and I'm glad we got to that. Will, any, right. anything else in the fourth chair before we hit our break? Uh, there's quite a bit. Let's see if I can remember everything that went through my brain while you guys were talking. <laughs> so uh, first of all, let's take a page from Nick Brown's book. Our I'm graphics. Holding it up there. Stat time Such with advanced Scott graphics on the TSL <laughs> podcast. Uh, so Scott, this, I thought this was so random we needed to include it, plus a math question will follow. So for the random stat of the day, 2022 – Calendar year 2022 started on a Saturday. When football seasons are played, when the calendar year starts on a Saturday, Virginia Tech has the best winning percentage versus the other days. 
65.66% of games won. So the math question huh. is, how many wins would that be this fall? 65%. Per, so eight and four? Yeah, eight and four. right around eight. I'll right. take it. Eight out of 12. I, w- I would take eight wins. You know, <laughs> Sign me up. Well, I want to know oh, how well, much eight, work Eight and 12 in the regular now. season, but do we count bowl game? No, let's just count regular season. <laughs> yeah, <but laughs> Make the math a little bit easier. Uh, two-thirds yeah. of a bowl game. So let's see. <laughs> Also, uh, TKK Cali wants to give a shout out to Daniel Marshall Griffith, former tech linebacker in the American Idol top ten. Yep. Mm, yeah. Is anybody following that? Like, uh, I mean, uh, not, I did see. I, well, I saw Jaden Payu tweeted a video. Uh, well, of of the of him singing in the locker room well, well, or D- something. Dan Marshall. My mom hit me up. She's like, "Do you know who Dan Marshall is? A former tech football player. He's on American Idol." And I'm like. No. There's no such thing as any former tech football right. player named Dan Marshall. He played as Daniel Unless he Griffith. played here in the 70s or 80s yeah. Yeah. before I started watching. Daniel Griffith. It turns out it's Daniel Griffin. Right. Yeah. yeah who's, uh, you who was know, a walk-on on linebacker, movement. right? Yes, who played for Lou Johnston. And Lou is, uh, sent guys like uh, oh, Keith Burnell, Vince Hall, Emmett Johnson, guys like that to Virginia Tech back in the day, longtime coach at Western Branch. So, uh, so yeah, I thought that that's an interesting connection for sure. Good for him. I think I watched one episode uh, when he made the top 24, but I keep seeing the tweets about it. So, go, yeah. yeah, go Dan Marshall, Dan Griffith. Let's go win the whole thing. <laughs> All right, so let's see. Um, I thought this was an interesting twist on what we were just talking about with the Spring Jam and, and so many uh, football alumni being in town. Uh, Mr. Bay Area Hokie on the message boards wants to know, what do you think will be the tangible benefits of the football alumni being more involved? Uh, he likes it prize reaching out. But what does that mean to the program in terms of, of W's and L's and tangible benefits? Well, one of the things I will say is, uh, do you guys see the the news about um, – Tyrod Taylor donating to the uh, I forget what it's called the market or the, uh, something like that. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, the the thing Mihol did. Yeah, yeah, the new Hokie Hoki market or something. Um, I, I think you'll see like a couple weeks Tim ago. Tim Settle made a donation. I was going to say Bud Foster tweeted that right. Tim Settle donated to the Hokie Club a couple weeks ago. So, so you know, you'll if see you, if you feel more connected, you'll you'll, you'll be more willing more to, likely give to give back money. Yeah, right. And I think I think also. Brent Prime mentioned that a group of f- former players, the Edmonds brothers, the Fuller brothers, Wyatt Teller, some of those guys, they came and spoke to like the group of recruits that were like visiting. And and, and when you have like all these NFL guys like coming and talking like with your recruits, like that sells. I'm telling you, man, if I'm an offensive line recruit and Wyatt Teller came and <laughs> talked to me, I'd be like, I want to go wherever that guy went. I, I mean, I mean, there was all those former players at the event. They're all big guys. And then there's Wyatt Teller that yeah. makes all of them look tiny. And he makes their paychecks look tiny, I'm sure, too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He got Unless paid. Dwayne Brown's in town. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I feel like that is something you can't – having those guys there in person, pitching your program for you, mm. Yeah, that's something that you can't really duplicate, if that makes sense. Like you can't really – you know. It's not the same when you get like an Edmonds brother on Zoom trying to talk to a recruit. Like when you got those guys, you and you have that whole group of guys there in person and everybody's going up there and, and speaking to the group and saying, you know, this is why I came to Virginia Tech. You know, you won't regret it, blah, blah, blah. You know, like a recruit, like if I was a recruit and I've got all these NFL guys that are talking to me, I'm like, dude, like this makes me, you, know, you guys want here to play? Like, okay, I can understand why. Right. You know, uh, I think it sells a little bit more. It. It has the potential to in certain areas. Yeah. Now, I also know, remember those three running backs from, like, Northern Virginia, Fredericksburg, who went to Penn State, like, three years in a row, one, two, three? Yeah. You know, one of them grew up as his, his – I remember his original 247 recruiting pro- pro- profile picture was him in a Virginia Tech jersey. His favorite player was Michael Vick, blah, blah, blah. Well, he comes in town for a visit one time, I think, to, like, a spring game or something like that, and – you know, tech, tech had Michael Vick meet him in person and talk to Devin him one on one. I think it was Devin. I Ford. think it was Devin. Yeah, Ford. it was Devin Ford. Um, yeah, because it was him wearing the Tech jersey. I know that for a fact. Um, so Tech had his favorite player come in and recruit him personally, and he still went to Penn State. Right. Mm-hmm. So it it can it only, help. It only helps so much. Right, yeah. right, right. I think the biggest thing is is you know some of these NFL guys like I mean. Tim Settle gives back from a financial standpoint. Yeah. And uh, I think some of them, obviously, 
Kevin Jones and Brendan Hill are involved in one of the NIL groups. They're two former players, you know. So I, I and that's actually maybe where former players would be more interested in helping than anything else. Maybe is with NIL because they didn't make any money, you know, where, yeah. when, when they were here. Uh, so uh, and and I'm not sure. Like I don't think your average tech fan, and and, and I bet if you ask most players, even saw a lot of your former players, like. How does your scholarship get paid for? And they just say, oh, well, it's free. We go to school for free, right? No. I mean, it takes a check from the athletic department to the university. I mean, somebody pays for it. It's just not – they just don't have to, right? Um, I don't think that they, they – a lot of them fully grasp that part of it, especially like current players. Um, but I think they all grasp the NIL thing. So I think that's some a place where former players – could help with more than anything else something tangible uh, and I, I think we could but, see that for like, sure like, like if Dwayne Brown came up to me and I was working for Virginia Tech and he said I'd love to make a $50,000 donation I'd tell him well here's Commonwealth and I'll go talk to them <laughs> that's 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 where I would want that money going personally yeah. well it was really cool to see all I mean the list goes on and on of people. I've, we didn't mention Chuck Clark was in town, I think, too. Yep. Uh, they showed him on the sidelines. Uh, I think Tyrod said on the broadcast he hadn't been back to Blacksburg in six years or something like that. No. So uh, That sounds bad. So <laughs> <laughs> so let, let me add one more thing to, to all that. We're, we're talking about the former players and specifically money that perhaps if they're more involved that they'll donate. It also has an effect on the fans. The fans love Correct. that stuff. There, there's yep. a level of excitement around the program that is uh, certainly bigger than it's been in a while. And that permeated the whole weekend with 3,500 fans at the baseball game uh, Friday night. I think that was the third largest crowd ever. Yep. And wasn't it the largest of the ACC? Largest in regular season history. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then softball, of course, being just jammed to the gills. And it, the effect that had on the Tech Athletic Department was they had so much going on that they had difficulty staffing. I was tailgating events. with a woman who had to leave the tailgate and go take tickets at, at baseball game, do wow. ticketing. And she talked about how understaffed they are and they cannot get, they just can't get people to work. And it's same, it's, it, that's the way it is in a lot of businesses around Blacksburg, right? Yeah. Now. yeah. And, and so I've, I've had off the record conversations with Brad Worthman. We got to get him on the podcast. He's got some fascinating stories to tell about that stuff. But, but back to the topic, it has an effect on the fans too, and they donate. So there is not a tangible line, getting back to the original question, there isn't a tangible line between players coming into town and wins and losses, but you can certainly see that it leads to increased excitement, increased donations, and these are all positive things. In a really cool weekend for Tech football, obviously Brent Price first spring game, got a lot of people in town, uh, and they'll surely be back in town for his games in the fall. I think that wraps up our football discussion. We're going to take our break. When we come back, we're going to talk about the Diamond Sports. Softball takes two of three from UVA. Baseball takes two of three from number two, Miami. We'll get to that when we come back on the other side of our break on episode 235 of the Tech Sideline Podcast. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back on episode 235 of the Tech Sideline Podcast. We spent the first half talking about spring football and the weekend in Blacksburg. Now we're going to move on to the Diamond Sports. Both teams in the top 10 now and had big weekends in Blacksburg over the last three days. But first, let's toss it over to Will in the fourth chair. I know he had one more comment to make. Yeah, Eric Fisher, who's always in the live chat when, when it starts, uh, said, do you think Tech will keep having spring game weekend be a football alumni thing going forward? And, and, you know, the obvious answer is sure, but my ears perked up when you guys talked about the athletic department helping out the Sons of Saturday guys with the spring jam. And uh, when, when we went to the spring jam, I, I, was, I thought to myself, man, this is really well done. Uh, as far as I know, that's the first time Sons of Saturday has done anything like that. And they're bringing it off like, like they've got a lot of experience at it. So... So, number one, that tells me part of the reason it was so good not to slight those guys because they're great guys, but they also got some help from the athletic department, and that tells you absolutely that's, that's kind of part of the strategy going forward or, or part of what they want to do on the weekend. And the other thing I do want to do is give a shout-out to Billy Ray Mitchell personally, and this has nothing to do with anybody helping. I got there at about 10.30 Friday night, 
And when I came around the corner of the building, I was 15 people deep in the line. And Billy Ray inside saw me immediately and was yelling and pointing. And he came out. And yes, we had we had sponsored the stuff they were doing. So I had a VIP pass. I had uh, Clark Ruin with me. Billy Ray bought out two passes because he saw who was with me. And so I was very impressed with that guy knows how to work a door at an event <laughs> like that. He did yeah. a great job. They were coming up and shaking everybody's hand and chatting with every every single person that walked through that door. Yeah, I mean, he's, they, he's got the energy for that, yeah. you know. And, and Pat, then, Pat, Pat Finn and Grayson Wimbish were, were both yeah, they doing were it too. I mean, they were I mean, all – Both those it, guys Yeah, too. it was kind of like – they were kind of like hovering around the door, and I don't mean that in a bad way. It was like <laughs> they were making sure that every single person that they came in, you know – that they they chatted them up. Thanks for being here. You know, so I, very well run. I saw Grayson on Saturday or Friday before that, and, and he was he's great. He's always great. So yeah. really cool from those guys setting that up and, and getting Will in the door uh, <laughs> with his VIP pass. I'm not a guy who stands out in a line of 15 people. <laughs> I'm 5'8". <laughs> All right, well, let's talk some diamond sports. Let's start with baseball. Baseball now ranked eighth in the country uh, after taking two of three from Miami. Three straight series wins against ranked ACC opponents. It seems like John Sheff's got a legit team uh, this year, everybody was kind of worried about last year with the drop off. Is it going to come again? It seems like they're steady right now. Yeah, and they're going to keep rolling. You know, as soon as they got ranked last year, that's when they started tailing off. Well, as soon as they got ranked this year, first they went on the road and beat uh, NC State L- Liberty. Oh yeah, yeah. I think they got ranked after the NC yeah. State series, right? Yeah, um, I, I believe so. Yeah, yeah. So they went on the road and beat Liberty, which is a really good RPI win. And then they come home and they take two out of three from number two Miami. Yeah. And hadn't Miami won something like Miami had just beaten UVA? They just swept, swept, UVA. Yeah, they just swept then number UVA. two, right? Fourteen uh, wins in a row. They had won fourteen wins in a row, wow. and Tech just trounced them in both of those Friday and Saturday games. Yeah, I mean, thirteen to two on Saturday. I guess that was Drew Hackenberg's worst start. He allowed two runs and <laughs> three. You know, just so terrible. <laughs> well, you know, he started Friday. Because, oh, Friday, because Friday, it, because Thursday, it, Friday, Saturday. Yeah, Excuse because it was Thursday, yes. Friday, Saturday. Number second start. No, right. but I mean, they com- they completely dominated. And I actually covered last night's game. Uh, Virginia Tech hosted VMI. They won 9-6. They went down early. They gave up five runs in, in the first inning. Yep. And then you know, that was not the best start from Ryan Kennedy, but – then they only allowed one run the rest of the night, and it was unearned. It was a pass ball, uh, and that was Ryan Metz. Um, I mean, they came back and dominated VMI for the rest of the game. The bats were hot. One through six combined, one through six batters, twelve for twenty-seven. That's four for four. I mean, they just like there's not a bad spot in that lineup, and you know I think. Yeah, they want. I mean, they they go to to Radford tonight and, and play yeah. at Radford. Um, but this team, I think the difference is that you know, as opposed to last year, they didn't really have solid pitching all the time. This year, they have consistent pitching on Friday on Friday and Saturday. Mm-hmm. Sunday, it can be a toss up sometimes. Sunday, it's kind of like the major league teams who don't have a fifth starter, so they throw a bullpen game once a week. <laughs> yeah, right. And, 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 and that, the opener, and that's yeah. the way it goes. But when you've got the offense Virginia Tech has, you can almost you know you have a chance to win those games even if you don't have yeah. a good pitcher. Speak, speaking of offense, all right. So Tech put out this graphic yesterday before the VMI game. So these are NCAA rankings, not ACC rankings. Virginia Tech is second in the country in batting average. 326, second in the country in slugging percentage, uh, 616, second in the country in home runs with 76, second in the country in home runs per game with 2.38. That actually seems low. <laughs> if you follow them on Twitter, it seems like it seems are low. Second in the country in doubles per game, 2.59, fourth in the country in on base percentage at 428, ninth in the country in scoring, 9.4, 13th in the country in doubles with 83. They can – I don't know who's first in some of these no, categories. I think, I think tennis in, in home runs. Tennessee. Okay. Tennessee. Okay. So, so I don't know if, if – like, Tech is consistently second in all these hitting stats. So assuming that somebody else isn't consistently first, Tech might be the best hitting team in the entire country. Yeah, and and that's what happens. And I, So I asked uh, Nick Bittison and, and Connor Hardigan last night after the game, I was like, what makes the you know the one through six guys so good? And they basically – and John Sheff said too – Essentially, like, you know, if one guy has a bad game, like, 
you know the other guy's going to go three for four. You know, yeah. like one of the other guys is going to hit the ball <laughs> well. And that's what happens when, you know, and I think Connor Hardigan was like, oh, I don't even care about like one through six. I go one through nine. Like their entire lineup is is good. They've just got really <laughs> good talent. And here's the other thing. A lot of them are veterans. Yeah. I mean, you go down that list and, you know, I know Kate Hunter and Jack Hurley are on the younger side, but Connor Hardigan's played college baseball for a while now. Nick Bittison. A while now. Eduardo Malinowski, uh, this was, Gavin Cross. Yeah, I remember, and I remember going to the Tech Florida, one of the Tech Florida State games last year, and like eight of Tech's nine starters were freshmen yeah, in yeah. that game. Uh, you know, Jack Hurley, Hurley was one of those guys, and he's in his second year now, and uh, and is you know absolutely tearing the cover off the ball like like everybody else. Um, so it's just it's a loaded lineup, man. Yeah, absolutely loaded. And, um, and when you combine that with good pitching, right. And you've seen different guys ha- go on tears throughout the year. Uh, Eduardo Malinowski early on in the season yeah. hit a home run in every game, basically. Yeah. And then Jack Hurley had that insane stretch. Which, Kate Hunter well, had an Kate uh, Hunter. on-base streak it's, that ended on Sunday or yeah. Saturday against Miami. And it's crazy what they're doing to team's number one starters. It's like Friday night fireworks every <laughs> yeah. Friday. I mean, you see uh, Miami's number one starter and NC State's number one starter UNC. and UNC's number Notre one Dame. starter Notre, Notre Dame. Dame's number one Notre starter. All, all coming to... <laughs> All come into the game against Virginia Tech with like a 2.0 ERA, and then at the end of the game, it's like 3.7. Yeah, it's and like I, it's I, shelled. I think you got to give a shout out to the pitching too. I yeah, mean, yeah. like, like oh, yeah. Griffin, Griffin Green, Green and Drew Hackenberg. Drew really Hackenberg good. is Christian Hackenberg's brother, yeah. former Penn State quarterback. Um, yeah, he's a freshman. Yeah, and true freshman, true freshman, and he has been dominant as the the Saturday starter. Griffin Green has evolved into a really solid Friday starter. Sunday is a toss up, like I said before, but like when you that that helps you get two series wins. And you know, yeah. I, I did the numbers. This was before the VMI game uh, yesterday. Um, in the last sixteen games, Virginia Tech was thirteen and three, and had averaged ten runs a game. Right. Wow. Uh, and I think- it, and it posted over twenty runs twice. So what's Tech's record in the ACC right now? Uh, nine and nine seven. And seven. So remember, they started zero and three. They got swept by Georgia, Georgia Tech, Tech to start the yeah. season, and they easily could have won two of those games. Yep. Right? Yeah, two walk-offs. So, so that means they're nine and four. One of those went fourteen series. innings, right? It, yeah. Second game of a double like header too. Oh gosh. <laughs> yeah. 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 So and then then and oh, and I was talking to Evan about this. Evan Hughes about this last night. So they the, the second game of the Sunday double header went fourteen innings. Then mm-hmm. Tech had to turn around, bus back. overnight. Back to Blacksburg, and then they had to bus up to Harrisonburg on Tuesday. Yeah. Everybody's dead from the weekend, and then they bus up to Harrisonburg, and then they lost. So they right. get JMU, I think, next week in yes. a rematch in Blacksburg. But I mean, they're just on a tear, and it's nuts because you know they were number twenty-one in rankings, and then jump up D one baseball's rankings to number eight right. this week. Wow! What if them and Hall and softball both hosted? It's, it's softball is definitely going to host. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And it's not certainly not outside the realm of possibility that baseball does. I remember when they the last time they did host, I think it was 2013. Uh, they didn't. Uh, they didn't really get into the discussion of being a host team until the last weekend of the season. I think they jumped into the top 15 like like the last weekend. Yeah. Of the season, basically when they uh they made a run to the ACC title game against North Carolina in the in the ACC yeah. tournament. Uh. And that and that's when like I remember, I think I was reading like the baseball cover baseball America coverage of it and they're like, you know what? All the numbers state that Virginia Tech should probably host, but nobody was having that conversation until like the last week of the season. Yeah, and there there uh, this you, year you can have that see, conversation right now. It's possible for for both baseball and, and softball. softball. And yeah. that's I think this is I think think we. Um, it's the first time ever in Virginia Tech history that baseball and softball are both ranked in the top yeah. ten, which is just nuts. That both of them were were that good because you knew what you were going to get out of softball this right. year, but everybody was kind of like, okay, baseball got in the top twenty five last year, got ranked, right. and then fell well, apart. Number eight is their highest ranking ever. Ever. Number three is softball's highest ranking ever. Yeah. So they're like, what the about pro- got knows program, his diamond sports? The programs are at their peak right now. Right. So Virginia Tech, Virginia Tech's RPI games through April nineteenth is twenty seven. I don't know how big of a role RPI plays and yep. whether or not they're chosen to, to right. host. Yeah. Right. Um, so we're right now we're seeing uh, 
peak Virginia Tech softball, peak Virginia Tech baseball, yeah. peak Virginia Tech men's basketball, peak Virginia Tech women's basketball. Come on, football. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> that doesn't even mention, like, you know, the, the soccers. The soccers are re- always really Soccers, the wrestling. wrestling. Yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a really Women's good golf. Old, it's <laughs> kinda sound, it kind of sounds like Virginia Tech, they, they, they might – Right now, know it. What might know what he's doing? Well, I'm. Well, no. I mean, the the director's cup standings. Oh yeah. yeah. I mean, as of right now, Tech has their highest ranking ever. ever. Yeah. And that doesn't even include the spring sports like softball and baseball and outdoor track and and things like that. So, kind of sounds like the Hokies are on their way to the highest their oh, highest yeah. ranking ever in the director's cup. And yeah. baseball again, eighth in the country. They've got, as Nick Brown would call it, the battle for Sharkies tonight uh, against Radford. Uh, the and Sharkies the, cup. <laughs> the Sharkies <laughs> cup. So one one more thing. I don't know if you guys saw me. I tweeted this out last night. I, I had uh, I, I must have turned on the ACC network, and UNC was playing uh, an out of conference game at home, and they put up the preseason coastal predictions. And I screen capped it, took a picture of it, and tweeted it out. Let's remember, Virginia Tech was picked last in the coastal, yeah, mm-hmm. and as of today is is second. second. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they're they're four games behind. Uh, and they're tied with UVA from that standpoint, but Tech's winning percentage is slightly higher in conference. The, than UVA. the coastal standings are crazy. It's like I want to say next to last, all the way up to second is like a game and a half. Everybody's yeah. a game. One well, half, half of those teams are ranked. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. It's, it's brutal. <laughs> ACC baseball is brutal. Yeah. yeah. So is so, ACC softball. So North yeah. Carolina yeah. is six games out of first. They're next to last. Yeah. And the number two team is four games out of first. So you're right. There's right. one, two, three, four, five teams clustered within, within two, uh, games. two games. Yeah. Right. Well, and no, Hokies get to face Boston College, who's towards the bottom of yeah, uh, of the uh, ACC standings they this are. weekend. When they, they get to play at Fenway They're Park. Fenway. Saturday's game in Fenway Park. That should be special for those guys. Now, it's important that they treat it like a regular game yeah. and not everybody go up to the plate trying to hit it over the green monster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Do yeah. what Boston, you've been doing. Boston College is 3-15 and 15 in the ACC, 15-21 and 21 overall. They are one of only two ACC teams with a losing record uh, overall. Yeah. Uh, who's the other one? Pop quiz. Uh, no idea. Duke. Duke is Duke 16 was, and 21. I was over. thinking somebody uh, has to be team at the, the team at the bottom the of the coastal. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, again, yeah, Fenway on Saturday. Yeah. That'll know, be fun. I know Evan Hughes is And te- tech, tech, still has to st- tech still plays Duke also. Yeah. Yes. So Tech actually has two easy series remaining, relatively speaking. The schedule's from what starting they have to been. ease up yeah. from what it's well, they still got to play UVA too yes. at UVA, yeah. and I think UVA is something like nineteen and two at home. Yeah, they're wow. really good at home. Yeah. But yeah, so uh, it definitely has been a tough stretch. Maybe a little easier now, but yes, but UVA baseball is. Where baseball has like been on a tear as of late, uh, softball hasn't been bad. Been but slumping, but <laughs> slumping. Out of three. Oh wow, they they didn't they wouldn't sweep UVA. But. Well, the, <laughs> definitely, I I wrote down it was a down series for the Hokies, even though they took two out of three, fell behind early in Friday's game, had one big inning to take that one, lose Saturday, and then needed a walk off on excuse me Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Yeah, yeah. yeah. in the finale, they needed a walk off to take it. Maybe good to have a down series against an opponent like UVA and not yes. the weekend before against uh, yeah, Florida State. Yeah, yeah, right, for sure. Um, you know, UVA is an improved program. Yes. Uh, Tech had been rolling and the highest ranking ever. And, you know, maybe you do need to get brought back down to earth a yeah, little bit yeah. before you hit the stretch run. But, I mean, uh, they've got huge showdown against number 14 at number 14 Tennessee tonight. tonight. Oh, 7 ESPN. o'clock on ESPN. ESPN, yeah. Like, not like ESPN U, like ESPN. <sighs> yeah. And... You know, I I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing to have a little stumble and yep. before you, you know, before you go to Knoxville and then they go to Louisville this upcoming weekend. And I didn't even realize, but like the softball season's coming to a close real real quick. I, I mean, this is the last more series. couple of weeks. Or sorry, yeah. they're at home against Louisville home against weekend. Louisville Apologies. and then at BC the next weekend. Yeah, I mean, so they they're the end of the season's coming up really fast, and you know, again, this is a team that. Assuming the bottom doesn't fall out for whatever reason, yeah. and it, it doesn't look like anything should bad should happen, I mean they're probably going to host a regional and a super regional. So like, mm-hmm. you know, this is the fact that they've been that consistent, both hitting and pitching throughout the entire season. It's just really impressive. Really good shot that they get their second trip to the women's college world series last year. Again, you come up one game short, but you have to go to LA and face one of the best programs in all of collegiate softball. Now you possibly get. 
a super regional needing to just win two games at home. Um, let's talk Emma uh, Lemley a little bit. Jake, before we leave that, did, did Whit Babcock mention that if Virginia Tech hosts, he will put up temporary stands uh, out, outside the I don't the know. Um, I, I, I think there was so. some mention of that. I'm yeah. sure there okay. would. Because it would probably, I mean, we saw a packed house this weekend, I would assume, uh, probably even more than that for a regional, super regional. And again, if you want more uh, softball coverage, we just did a podcast with assistant coach Mike Lewis last week, so go check that out. Um, let's talk Emma Lemley. Uh, less illegal pitches on Friday. <laughs> I actually don't know if they called any on her. I don't think they did. Uh, in that game, but... Do we think there might have been some sort of mechanical change that they implemented that maybe m- threw off her game a little bit? Because UVA made a lot of solid Chip, contact Chip against her. Chip, uh, our softball writer Chip Grubb, he didn't mention one. I, I wouldn't think that you want to mess with that in the middle of the season. Yeah, I, I think that could throw everything off. Yeah. And so I think that's an off-season thing. From from what I gained from he, Chip, didn't specifically mention one in his recap, which you can go read on Tech Sideline from the weekend. Um, I mean. Pete Demore basically said, "Okay, she didn't get called for anything, so I don't see any reason why she should get called for it many times moving <laughs> forward." I mean, and, and again, it just it varies from umpire to umpire, I guess. But um, but yeah, I, well, I they're saving it up for a key pitch in the College World yeah, Series. I'm, just wait. Well, I, I talked to Coach Demore <laughs> for our broadcast last week, and I asked him, "Is this something you're going to have to just deal with?" And he said, "Yes." He yeah. said, "If they had been calling this for two straight months, they might have been able to fix it and work on it, but now yeah. you're too late in the season." Yeah. Uh, so we'll see. There, Lemley gave up a couple of home runs, a couple of doubles in that game against Virginia, and, and again, Virginia really improved. They had scored one run in the last eight games against the Hokies. I believe they scored ten this weekend. Uh, so yeah. Yeah. They, got a, they got a much better record this yes. year than they have in yes. the past. Yeah. Uh, they, I believe they're right at 500 in the ACC, 9-9, mm-hmm. nine and nine, yeah, I think, after this weekend. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's what? It's Tennessee and then... Home against Louisville this weekend. And then do they have, do they softball in the midweek next week? I believe so. Uh, I think on the road. Uh, no, actually, no, they don't. They get the full week off between Louisville and Boston College. And, and then I think they wrap up the season with two home midweeks that first week of May. Makes sense. So, I mean... And, the schedule's not. I mean, I think this is the biggest game left in the regular season. Yes, probably against, only ranked team against, I against Tennessee. So, not. I don't want to say they're cruising, but but the schedule's not necessarily going to get any more difficult. Where you already played a gauntlet, like going to Florida State and stuff, playing Florida State and UCF and back to back weekends. So, I don't. know. I think, assuming they just keep level pace, you know, they keep going on the pace they're going. I mean, they're going to be a top five team. You know, they're sitting at number three right now. Number three in the RPI, right. not necessarily just yeah. the rankings in the RPI. You know, they're going to be a top five team come, you know, the regionals and super regionals. And, you know, hopefully we're sitting here in three. beginning of June <laughs> saying, wow, they're going to a college world series. <laughs> and, and you would think as long as there are no major slip ups, like yeah. you lose two of three to BC or Louisville, they're going to not move down in the rankings, yeah. uh, especially right. with a win tonight, if they can get one at Tennessee. Yeah. Again, that's a Tennessee's a very good program, a top 15 team. Um, I was talking to Whitney Showalter, who was my analyst, and she said that that was a big rivalry back in her day when she played with the team. So uh, it should be fun to watch tonight. So Hokie, Chip, did, uh, Chip Grubb did chime in. He said uh, last year with COVID, both softball and baseball submitted bids to host. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, and they submitted them early, right? Uh, but then they both went down in performance. But so they, his point is, they are prepared to do it. They they've prepared to do it before. Mm-hmm. Uh, he apparently, Whit Babcock did mention he was going to put up temporary stands, and according to Chip, there was no real change in Emma's delivery, just a little more emphasis on dragging the foot. And I was there on uh, Friday night, and. She dragged it so hard they had to come out and, and <laughs> fill in the the ruts she that was she digging was hole. digging, and, and that, that that game was that game was tough to watch. It ended up five to three, but it felt like ten to two because yeah. Tech was not hitting UVA. UVA's pitcher apparently came in with a seven something ERA, and Tech struggled against yeah. her. And she and, was zero and two with a seven ERA yeah. heading into that game. <laughs> uh, I once when I was in Vegas a few years ago, I bet on a baseball game, and the Braves were in first place, and they were playing, I forget who. I thought they were playing the Padres, who were in dead last that year. And the Braves were starting their ace, who had an ERA of under two. And the Padres were starting a guy who, in like 10 starts, had an ERA of over seven. So, you know, like, most baseball lines are like one and a half runs, right? Yeah. So, I'm like, oh, God, the Braves are going to crush them. 
because it's in Atlanta. The Braves are way better, and we're throwing our ace, and they're throwing their worst pitcher, right? The Braves won one to nothing. They could not hit that guy who is probably out of baseball now because he's so <laughs> right, bad. Right. You know, it's a round ball and a round bat. <laughs> That's you right. You never know what's going to happen. <laughs> nope. Uh, well, definitely a lot of fun tonight. Both programs in action: baseball at Radford, softball at Tennessee. That game on ESPN at seven. Baseball, yeah, I believe baseball is on ESPN Plus. ESPN Plus. So check those out. And then this weekend, softball at home against Louisville. Baseball on the road at Boston College with one of those games in Fenway. So. Plenty coming up, both teams on a roll right now. With that, let's check in with Will. Any more good questions before we get out of here? This one's kind of uh, off the beaten path. Uh, apparently, Josh Passner, Georgia Tech uh, bas- basketball head coach, suggested playing full round robin in the ACC, which would be 28 conference games since there are 15 teams in the league. Yeah. Um, I, I can think of some not – so are you are – you It would have hurt Virginia Tech's – Strength of schedule this past year yeah. since the ACC was. Although, well, although there would have been no having a chance no to non conference, having a chance to, even, to beat Duke at home. Yeah, yes, you would yeah. have gotten Duke at home. Yeah, but, but the thing is, like, how do you compare that to, to uh, when when other leagues aren't doing that? How do you make the comparison? Like, does seventeen? If what if you win sixteen or seventeen games, but you don't play Radfords and Maryland Eastern Shores yeah. anymore, but you only win 16 or 17 games. I, I would say if... What, what, is the tar- what does the committee do? I would say if other major conferences aren't doing that, don't do don't it. Do it. <laughs> don't do it. Don't do it. Because, yeah. Yeah, because imagine if Virginia Tech goes 16 and 12 in a 28-game conference schedule. You're, you're hurting yourself. You're hurting you yourself because you only have 16 games. They're not going to put games. you in. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. the ACC would be cannibalizing itself while the other conferences right, right. are just saying, okay, we'll get our 20 right, right. Well, wins. And, of course, you'd play three. If you play 28 conference games, you'd play like three non-conference yeah. games. You win all of those. Even then, you're 19 and 12. So 19 and 12, and then you're 16 and 12 in the ACC, which is which is very good when you think about it. But yeah, you got up to 19 wins and you're a 10 seed, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, so no, I don't. I think Pastner. I don't think Pastner's a very good basketball coach to begin with. <laughs> uh, and yeah, that, that, that sounds like a half baked idea. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So Hokey Pro asks, and, and I actually think I want to answer this one, and then we'll toss it over to you guys. Uh, Hokey Pro says, "What do you feel the impact would be from both baseball and softball being able to host regionals?" in the same year should it happen uh I'm, I'm not sure exactly what sort of impact he's looking for um i don't know that hosting a regional makes a whole lot of difference on the recruiting trail and stuff like that uh and i'm not sure it really impact baseball all that much i do think having to host a regional for softball the softball team is so good this year and there's so much interest in it and we when we had mike lewis on the podcast we talked about how interest is it ramps up rapidly. There's a difference between having a team ranked in the top 25 and a team being ranked in the top two or three. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The interest goes way up. So if Virginia Tech hosts a, uh, it, it's no mystery that VT's softball facilities are behind a lot as of As far schools. as the stadium itself goes. Yeah, the yeah. stadium itself. The, the indoor facility is great. Right, right. Uh, but the stadium itself is play and catch up. Mm-hmm. And so, if they were to host a regional, I just think that would bring a lot of uh, attention, a lot of attention, and not good attention. Maybe to give it. a little push. Well, yeah. it's when baseball had to host a regional in 2013, right? And they had to bring in a temporary press box. Yeah, right. And it it was just kind of the whole. It was kind of embarrassing. Yeah. So so then fans naturally start saying, "Oh, well, we need to expand the the softball stadium." Well, the difficulty with that is that all of Virginia Tech's facilities, fundraising resources right now are being allocated to raising funds for Castle Coliseum. Yes. Now, that said, when Sheridan just donated $5 million specifically for the football locker room. Right. So you get I, the, the, over, donors. the overall point is that if someone steps up, someone like Wynn Sheridan says, I'll start it with $5 million bucks for Correct. softball. Right, right. You're more likely to get big donor support to build a better softball stadium. When you're or on renovate stages, the one that yeah. they got, right? Because it's not something that like – it makes financial sense for Virginia Tech to take out a big loan to do. Yeah. Right? And and just add to their monthly bottom line. Well, unless they put like, like one or two luxury boxes up there, 
uh, uh, there is a diehard softball crowd, and maybe the, some of them have money. Yeah, and, right, right. But you know, the point here is, yes, you're more likely to get outside funding for something like that if you host a regional and you get national attention and some wealthy people uh, say, okay, I want to keep that momentum going. Yeah. Right. It'll be interesting to see, again, both these teams set up to possibly host a regional softball, maybe a super regional, so it'll be fun to watch. Well, you remember the softball stadium did get expanded after Alan, Allison Tincher left because there was no way Tech was going to host. Angela Tincher? Angela. What did I call her? Allison. Allison. Ang- Angela Tincher. Her I'm unfamous getting, sister, I'm getting, Allison. I'm getting old. <laughs> but remember, there was no way Tech's, the softball stadium was so small back then and so out of date that there was no way Tech was going to ever host. Yeah. So they had uh, so, so we're sitting there thinking, okay, man, we got a pretty darn good softball program. So they expanded it then in hopes they, that they could host in the future. As it turned out, they haven't really had a chance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, but even still, they're, they're still behind, even with that improvement. Yeah. So it, the weekends, if baseball and softball would both, if, ba- if softball would host a regional, super regional, and then baseball, it would back. It would be three week weekends in a row: softball, regional, softball, super regional. When baseballs at the ACCs, yeah. and then baseball, baseball regional. regional. Okay. So, a lot of, so, lot of sports and black. So there would not be overlap. No, which, which no, would be no good overlap. There. But it would so, be three. It would be three straight weeks where you could come and watch. Baseball, softball, and Blacksburg. That'd be very, very cool. Um, well, sadly, we are out of time. We've got to get out of here. We'll get to some basketball next week, I think, uh, with some of the transfers. We didn't quite have time for that today. Uh, but quickly, what's coming up on Tech Sideline over the next few days? Spring practice recaps, kind of like where Virginia Tech stands at each position on offense, each position on defense. Perfect. And then baseball. Uh, ba- baseball stuff. Baseball's at Radford tonight, obviously, as we mentioned. Um I'm I'm probably going to write up something in the next couple of days. Whit Babcock had some interesting comments when we got to talk to him during in the middle of the spring game at halftime, just on NLI stuff, um, NIL. And, uh, NIL stuff. Sorry, <laughs> a lot of um, people say N- NLI. Yeah, so N- thing, NIL just out of, stuff. Just out of order. Um, you know, give, being able to uh, being because of the court ruling, being able to give athletes money because of. Because uh, they pass classes. Yeah, essentially. Google Alston funds. Uh, Alston funds. Yeah. So, yeah, that stuff. So, I don't know. It's, it's football's over, so we got a lot of free time. So. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Check it out, techsideline.com. I want to thank all of you on set. David Cunningham, across the way, managing editor for TSL. He is at the real D Cunna on Twitter. Chris Coleman to my right, lead analyst and columnist for TSL. He is at Chris Coleman TSL on Twitter. Will Stewart, our VIP in the fourth chair, <laughs> at Will Stewart TSL on Twitter, our founder and general manager. Behind the scenes, Malcolm Stewart always does a great job. I'm your host, Jake Lyman, signing off here on episode 235 of the Tech Sideline podcast. Enjoy your weekend, Hokies fans. We'll see you next time.